Okay, I think uh, we should get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And my name is Song Liu. We got uh, David Vernet here. And this also our work uh, together with Rick Van Real, who unfortunately cannot join us today. And um, we are all software engineers working for Meta, AKA Facebook. And today we want to talk about our experience with uh, using kernel live patching at scale. All right, so um, we're going to be going over a few things, uh, start by talking about um, the existing options for applying kernel fixes, go over some of the history of how kernel fixes in the past and still the present, obviously, uh, were applied when there was an issue that needed to be fixed. Um, so of course, the canonical thing you can do is apply a fix via a full reboot. So quite involved, of course, you have to install a new kernel, do a full reboot, the kernel is unloaded via the bootloader or UAF, UEFI firmware, however you configure it. Uh, and then the kernel itself does a full boot, initializes all the subsystems, powers on all the devices, uh, et cetera. So um, full reboot is great, uh, but it's really slow. Um, so obviously the positives are you get post checks, power on self-test checks. So you have more confidence that the hardware isn't buggy. There's no issues you have to worry about um, with the hardware. It's also simple to boot from a power off state. The devices are powered off. The host state hasn't been corrupted yet. Hopefully never will be. Um, there's no running tasks. So, you know, it's a simple model for, for applying fixes. The cons are of course that you have to migrate everything off of the host um, and post checks can be slow. For really large hosts, they can be super slow, sometimes even on the order of hours. And then once it finally does power on and the kernel is booted, you have to rewarm all the caches so even when you migrate all these workloads back to the host, you might have some tail latency issues, things might be a little bit slower than, um, than you want them to be, obviously. So to mitigate this, we invented something called k-exec. Um, k-exec is like doing a full reboot, but you don't go through the post checks. So you don't do a power cycle on the host. You install the new kernel, you k-exec into the new kernel, which means that you power down the kernel, kill the devices, power down all the, uh, excuse me, kill the tasks, power down all the devices, load the new kernel image into memory and then reboot the kernel just as you would for a full reboot. So of course that's faster than doing a reboot. You don't have to go through the hardware, you don't do the post checks, um, but it is more complex. Uh, you know, you can corrupt things when you do k-exec. I'm sure the people that wrote k-exec are fully aware of that. Um, and the kernel still, uh, but it's still simpler than doing something like live patch, which we'll explain in a moment. Um, because the kernel is still doing a full reboot. So all the tasks are killed, all the devices are powered down, and when you reboot the kernel, you're starting from a fresh slate, assuming you haven't messed anything up. Um, the cons are, you still have downtime. You still have to migrate everybody off of that, that host. Everything is killed, like I said, so that, that host isn't usable while it's rebooting. Um, things are still getting more complex. Like I said, you could corrupt uh, host state, and then you still have to rewarm the caches because you're still rebooting the kernel. Okay, so what is KLP? And what does it solve? Uh, live patching is a mechanism in the kernel that lets you update kernel functions at runtime without doing any reboots or any resetting of the host state. Um, there's special kernel modules, uh, patches, and they're inserted with insmod, just like any other module. And uh, they use ftrace with the IP modify flag to replace the existing kernel function. So it's pretty nifty. Um, Obviously this is much faster than k-exec. Uh, it takes on the order of a couple of seconds generally to apply a patch, uh, which is obviously much faster than a reboot. No downtime required. You don't even have to, nothing has to stop tasks and run concurrently with live patch. So this is like a really efficient way to apply fixes. Um, the cons are that it's pretty complex. You have to deal with the system with live tasks, workloads are running that your customers uh, are using. Um, and so if something goes wrong, uh, the workloads that we're running on that host are going down without having been migrated. Um, it also requires uh, a lot of, not a lot of, but extra engineering work that you don't have to worry about with, with something like k-exec or reboots. Um, not everything can be live patched. You can't live patch data, even though live patch has a mechanism called uh, shadow variables that let you uh, provide a mechanism for sort of updating data in a safe way without actually patching you know, global data in the kernel. Um, even if you have a patch that's correct, you have to look at it really carefully. Um, 
if you look at the ecosystem, the tools that are available in the ecosystem, which Song will talk about, um, all sorts of warnings are sprayed everywhere saying like an expert needs to look at this. If this breaks, it's your fault. You really need to know what you're doing. And then even if a patch um, is actually you know, live patchable on its own, you sometimes have to finagle things because there's just limitations in, uh, in, in what you're doing when you live patch. It's hand wavy, but extra work is required is, is the highlight. So just a little bit of an overview of, of how a live patch works, at really high level, skipping you know, over some details here. But at the start of most functions in the kernel, um, we have this NOP instruction, which we can overwrite with uh, a direct call to an ftrace handler. Um, and then in the ftrace handler, there's some logic that checks to see whether the uh, patch has been fully applied. Um, and if it has been fully applied, which I'll explain what that means in a second, you call the newly patched function from every task in the system. And if it hasn't been fully applied, it checks to see if the task is finished migrating to the new patch. Migration means that the, uh, the task is no longer running the function being patched anywhere in its call stack. And uh, if, it, if that's the case, the live patch subsystem marks it as patched and safe to, to use. The reason that that's necessary is because uh, you don't want to call a function that's being patched if it's higher in the call stack. Functions are there for a reason. Um, if the semantics of that function change, Maybe you change how locking is done. Maybe you change what kind of corner cases you're, you're looking at uh, to decide if you need to lock. You can end up deadlocking or causing all sorts of problems. So you have to wait until you're not calling it anymore. Finally, once every task in the system is transitioned, um, this unlikely branch here is no longer hit and you always take the, uh, the newly patched function. So there's a little bit of overhead because you're always using this ftrace handler. Um, going back to kind of some of the limitations of live patch, you probably don't want to do uh, like a patch on you know, the spin lock implementation because now you have a lot of extra logic happening in what's supposed to be a very hot path. Um, and then the, the aftertrace handler stays registered indefinitely until the, uh, the patch is either replaced or, or uh, removed if that's what you choose to do. Okay, so song. Okay, so I would like to give a quick overview about the existing lab patch ecosystem. So KLP or lab patch is uh, very common among people called enterprise distros. And the primary goal, as people understand, is to want to fix bug without rebooting or without even stop your workload. And there are common, there are very well-known ones. There's a K patch from Red Hat, there are K Grafter from, <clears throat> from SUSE, and the K Spice from Oracle. And I, I would like to take the chance to thank Red Hat uh, Fox to share K patch two chains and supporting these tools that's very helpful for our in our work. And there are also third party who build like uh, patches for public CVEs for public available uh, kernels. And as far as we know, all these uh, uh, different flavors of lab patch use the similar in kernel mechanism. Okay. Now, how do we and why do we use uh, KLP at a hyperscale? First, we want to draw our fixes faster. At a hyperscale, we don't have any problem rebooting one machine, but uh, to reboot every machine is a totally different uh, story. First, at hyperscale, downtime is not an option. Facebook never go down, otherwise people are gonna call the police. And Therefore, we have to do the kernel upgrade in your rolling base. You have to migrate your service to the different service because you uh, different server because you, you can reboot this server. And as a result, our typical cycle to upgrade the fleet is in the order of weeks. And of course, that's not fast enough for critical urgent issues. And on the other hand, with KLP, we are capable to roll the fix much faster. Another case we found with uh, KLP is that they are very helpful to debug the very, the most tricky issues. Nowadays, like uh, in the kernel, we have very good uh, tracing tools like BPF, Ftrace, Perf. However, we will find the cases that tracing is very, very, it's not very straightforward. For example, you only want to trace one condition in the middle of a function, maybe after three if. That's not easy to create a trace for that. However, if you use KLP, you can put a print K or maybe a traceable function at the exact location you want to trace. 
Another case is when we find there's some uh, error condition it's not easy to reproduce. And if you want to change some logic that either require reboot or even reload the module, you may destroy the reproduce and you may take you hours and on many machines to get you back to there. However, with KLP, we will be able to turn small things and try with exactly the uh, same reproduce the scenario and that will speed up our debug many, many times. So now how we use it. We try very hard to produce, to enforce homogeneous configuration. What does that mean? That means the user cannot decide which fixes they want. We have control, okay, this is this kernel, you, you should run this kernel with this set of fixes. And the other side of this requirement is a promise from the kernel team say, hey, we're gonna promise the KLP will not do anything bad. Which in other words, we don't want anything that uh, is good for certain workload, but it's gonna hurt for other workload. So with this promise and this requirement, we will be able to do something called a cumulative patch. What this means is that we combine all the fixes for one kernel into one KLP module. These have multiple benefits. First, we greatly reduce the test metric. Every patch attached alone, we just need to test everything alone. And the kernel provides some very nice feature with the replace flag for the KLP, which means we can finish attach a new KLP and detach the old KLP in an atomic switch. And we'll talk about the uh, atomic KLP switch, uh, uh, KLP transition later. And, and another part of the using KLP at hyperscale is we need the KLP rollout to 100% managed by automations. What we do is we pack a KLP module into our RPM file, something like uh, it's a KLP for kernel version X is the hotfix Y, which is the versioning we have for the KLP. Then we manage the KLP rollout just as we manage any other RPMs. And we use our health check built in the infrastructure to help the rollout of the KLP. What it looks like is that we compile the kernel metric with the new KLP versus the kernel, the same kernel with the old KLP or with no KLP if this is the first ever KLP for this kernel. And we check for new crashes, increased failure rate, or unusual KLP transition failure rate, and et cetera. And if any of this metric look bad, the automation will stop the rollout and set alarm for some human being to look at the issue. So the result, KLP has helped us a lot. Right now we have millions of server running with KLP all the time. Typically we roll out a new KLP in the, order, in the time frame of one week, which is already much faster than regular kernel rollout. And at full speed, we can tightly patch the whole fleet in hours. But we haven't seen a case that we really want to do that. <laughs> and as we use KLP in our work, we find it's essential to keep our fleet healthy. And there's multiple attributes of that. I want to talk about two things. One is like in the past, we used to see, oh, this kernel is bad. We need a fix only release just to fix a bug. This is very distracting for regular feature release, which usually we push that release to the next number. And in some worst case, we will see, okay, this fix only release is not enough. We need another fix on top of it. But now with KLP, we eliminate almost all the fix only kernel release. Most of the fixes, urgent fixes are shipped out with KLPs. Another, case, another benefit is like, we no longer debug the same issue twice. As I mentioned that our, current, current, our typical rolling cycles is in order of weeks, which means if we fix a bug, we ship the uh, fix in a newer kernel, 
this takes weeks before the whole fleet to get a new kernel. And it's totally possible another team will hit the same issue in a different, uh, uh, you know, different uh, condition. And with KLP, we'll be able to roll the fix soon, uh, uh, soon enough that we don't have to debug the same issue twice because it's already fixed in the fleet. Okay, so now we wanna take you through some of the bugs that we've run into and some of the issues we've run into. Um, because we're at hyperscale, um, we've used live patch in ways that, uh, that have allowed us to find some issues that you probably wouldn't encounter or have maybe noticed at a smaller scale. Um, and I think the highlights I would say is that small performance issues uh, become pretty big problems when you're talking about a scale of millions of hosts. Um, we'll give an example of a bug there. Uh, this could actually happen in smaller cases too, but we found that uh, KLP can sometimes conflict with tracing because of that NOP instruction where we register the ftrace handler. If you were tracing that function in other contexts, you have to be careful not to uh, not to overlap um, and try to try to live patch a previously tracing function. Um, and we also observed that there were some transition failures, which is problematic at hyperscale, but probably or maybe not at a, at a smaller scale. So the first bug I want to talk about was. Uh, a bug that we actually fixed and ended up sending upstream, where we noticed that when we were sending out a KLP, uh, we would see a short uptick, a short but large uptick in missed IO, and this would cause alarms to get set up all across the company. Um, specifically, we saw that TCP retransmits would, would bump up. We also saw similar but different symptoms like uh, IO and F-sync latency would go up, so we'd have database stalls. Um, again, you know, lasting for one to two seconds, really short, the span of the live patch, uh, um, insertion, of course, but across millions of hosts, like everybody you know, loses their minds and thinks that everything is, is breaking. So what happened? Um, what happened was the insmod task was hogging the CPU and starving KSoft IR QD. So I'm sure a lot of people in the crowd uh, have run into this problem in one form or another. If you've ever added a con resched, there's a good chance that you are aware this can happen. Um, so we compile our kernel without preemption with config preempt equal n. So the problem was that when you load a KLP module, you have to do relocations like you do with any other uh, module. And then during KL sim symbol lookup, uh, we were starving KSoft IRQD because it's a very hot path and we weren't doing a con resched. So the fix was con resched, um, and then we eventually upstream that. Uh, the fun thing is we actually originally, uh, we, we sent it upstream and then we backported it, but we, all, we ended up fixing this in our fleet with a KLP. Um, because uh, as Song said, we have KLP available to roll out fixes. We use it all the time. We don't want to wait for the next release to be able to roll out future KLPs. So we knew that we were going to see all sorts of alarms go off for a couple of seconds. We rolled out the fix in KLP with a KLP. Everybody lost their minds for a couple seconds and then it never happened again because we could roll future KLPs out. Um, we don't know if there, there may be other limitations of where you can apply a KLP. You can't, you can't patch uh, the ftrace handler. Obviously that's no trace. Um, but I'm, I haven't been able to find an issue anywhere else in the live patch subsystem where you couldn't patch it. Like even, even the, uh, the init module callback, uh, you can't transition a task that has that function in its call stack, so the insmod task wouldn't be able to be transitioned. But eventually that would exit and then live patch actually asynchronously tries to uh, transition tasks after that too. So I think that would be fine. Um, so it's a testament to the robustness, I think, of live patch that you can fix things with a, with a KLP. But um, that was one, one issue that was fun that we, we ran into. Okay, so the next, as we work in the uh, hyperscale for a long time, we realized tracing is a first class citizen in the data centers. So monitoring and tracing, they're as important as the main service because if your main service is down, like uh, people know that it's through monitoring and tracing. And so no matter which one goes down, there are gonna be alarm, wake up people at midnight and look at this. And whoever got woke up will be equally mad at uh, whoever break it. So, and as a result, we need to make sure the KLP, while you fix the kernel bug, should never break uh, these tracings. But unfortunately we have, hit a couple issues. The first one is like we found the KLP may break your trace point. The reason behind that is like uh, your KLP, you when you build a, a function, this function cannot have jump labels. And what we handle in the two trains, like uh, if we, we cannot jump labels, because 
twist point call is the jump label, the two chain will just remove it. And this one show us as the block trace start missing events. And we spend some time to realize, oh, this is because we are using a KLP to this function, and this function calls your trace point, and it's no longer happen when you have the KLP version of this function. And fortunately, this, fix, this bug was partially fixed uh, in 5.8 or newer kernels. And this work done was by Josh Poinboff. And uh, by partially fixed, I mean, if this trace point is in VM Linux, then we don't have any problem. This uh, trace point call will not be removed by the live patch. But uh, unfortunately, if the trace point is installed by a different kernel module, we'll have the same problem. So another, another case with KLP and tracing is like we found KLP may break tracing tools, may oh, conflict with tracing tools. So this specific example we look at is like we have KLP and a BPF trampoline on the same function. And they both use ftrace flag IP modify, meaning we want to modify the IP of this function. And by definition, yeah, they should not have, we should not have two of them on the same function, otherwise who, who will decide where we go? And the behavior is like uh, the first one come wins, whoever comes late will fail. And this thing we have shipped the fix in the latest 6.0 kernel. And what we have done is on one hand, we make sure the ftrace direct function, which is used by BPF trampoline, no longer set IP modify. Then we teach BPF trampoline to say, hey, if you are working with someone with IP modify, these are the things you can do to, uh, to make sure you can, these the two can work on the same function. So this one will be released to the world in a few weeks. So the next thing we want to talk about is the KLP transition failures. And recall that we have to, uh, when we apply a KLP, we have to finish this transition. Specifically, we get from this KLP on patch state to the KLP patch state. And this transition happens for each task. And basically we need every task to find a transition point. The transition point should uh, usually be two cases. One is the task access kernel space, meaning you're not, not talking any kernel functions, you can finish the transition. The other case is the task goes to sleep and when it's sleeping, there's no to be patched functions in the stack, then okay, you can finish the transition. As a result, we know there's kernel thread. We never go back to the user space. They sometimes fail the transition. Usually the transition, uh, the failure rate is not really high, but it's a low failure rate times a big fleet. This could be mean many, many failures. So we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful about them. So here's a real world example we have seen. So we have the butter FS reclaim work that could run for many seconds. This thing runs on the event onboard work queue. So from a work queue items point of view, it's clearly not good. You should free up the queue for others. But if you just look at the thread, it's not that bad because this work costs kind of reschedule many times per second. So if there's something else like soft error kicking in, this one will not uh, block that. So we are not going to the first issue like David mentioned. However, because this work will run for many seconds, we are seeing 10 times more increase in the KLB transition failure rate. It's simply because this event unbound work kills, this thread uh, never go to sleep. Unfortunately, this is the case that we cannot fix with KLP because we are trying, we have tried to ship a KLP with the fix and we're seeing 100 times more uh, transition failures. This is because even when event unbound goes to sleep, 
it slips with to be patched function in the stack and just not safe to do that at that point. So right now we have a temporal fix. We have this KLP try switch task in the work queue thread. And it's low overhead enough, but it seems not a universal uh, uh, solution yet. And we are working with the upstream community for a better fix, and we'll talk about that later. So our ongoing and future works. So as we mentioned, like because we have a big fleet, if we hit some small corner cases, that could be a big issue for us. So we practically try to find all the corner cases and try to fix them before it actually hit us. And here's the example. So we can use KLP to attach uh, apply fixes to other kernel modules. Everything works fine. You can load the module first or load the KLP first. Either way, you get a, a patch applied correctly. However, if you have a kernel module with patches, you cannot reload the module. And if you load, you unload the module and try reload it again, it will fail on some sanity check in the relocation address uh, part. This has been a non-issue for years, but uh, it hasn't been a priority for the community because typically unload module is not a uh, operation people are gonna do. However, at uh, our scale, we quickly identify, oh, that could be a huge problem. We have a fleet run by automation. We have people run RM mode, uh, with the automation, we can easily run that on millions of servers in an hour, and later, suddenly, all of them cannot work again. So we're actively to we're actually fixing that. And besides that, we are working on adding new features to the toolchain. Here are a couple of examples. One thing we are trying to do is to use Clown PGO support to compile kernel, and we see there's a benefit. What it does is like is take a profile uh, data and put it into the compiler and help the compiler to optimize the code. To build KLP for this kernel, we need a k-patch to take the same profile data as the input. And it's not a dramatic change, and we're almost done, and we are using that in production for a long time. Unfortunately, this part is not upstream yet because the kernel part is not upstream yet. So seriously, I don't know <laughs> what's the plan with that, but uh, this is the work we need, and it's working great for us. Uh, would you mind keep that for the end? Thank you. And so the next thing we are working at is to build one KLP for both in-tree fixes and out-of-tree fixes. And this, is the requir this requirement comes, uh, comes from that we need a replace flag, which means we cannot have KLP on the system, one system. So we have to put them together and to get our homogeneous uh, configuration. And this is something we are working right now. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, we are working for uh, working on reducing KLB transition failures. Uh, here's an interesting idea. We got uh, Peter Mladek, and basically, uh, when we see uh, KLB transition fail to finish at the first time, we use ftrace to attach this try switch task to specific functions that is blocking the transition. And then the pending task will keep running with all these ftrace functions. And now they will finish the transition without going to sleep. And we're not sure how this is gonna work out at the end, but I think it's a very interesting idea and we have big hope on it. And that's all we have for today. Question? Yes? Uh, one question. Do you also consider like that support for SMB files? Because there are some security issues that come up. So, 
So we need the knobs. Uh, we need. Uh, okay, now the mic is working. Live patching for assembly files, like there is a uh, .s file, syscall entry path or VM exit path, and you want to fix something there. So uh, I, I, we tried doing that. Live patch didn't work. Do you run into issues? And there, are there any plans of implementing support for that? I think as long as it's accessible by KL Sims and you can register an ftrace handler, it should work. I can't think of any reason it wouldn't. I don't know enough about ftrace to know if if you can wire an assembly function to be callable by callable and recognized by ftrace. Um, but if you can, I, I think it should work work just fine. Yeah. Actually, um, most assembly, all, all assembly functions don't have the ftrace knob up in them. So in general, it's not really possible to patch assembly right now. Yeah, the knob is the harder requirement. And but you, you could add a knob in your assembly, couldn't you? You could. Yeah, we just haven't. But haven't we, need to, we need to add a knob and we need to ftrace to, to track that. Um, I don't think, uh, as long as we can add a knob, I don't think that's physically impossible. Yeah, yeah. we need no tracing and entry. Not going to happen. <laughs> no, I, I, I understand the concern is that we shouldn't be tracing this stuff, right? But it, we could mark these as non-traceable and still have a knob there for live patch. It's, these are different use cases, but there is just one knob there, right? And we we, we concerned about somebody's going to attach a trace point on syscall entry or VM exit and ruin their, wreck their performance completely. I, I do get that. But sometimes you didn't, do need to live patch those places as well, uh, especially well, in like bugs. Miroslav just mentioned to me on IRC that they once did this by rewriting the IDT and the uh, Cisco MSR. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is possible. I, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, especially the Facebook. <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of creative solutions that you can do, but the more creative, probably the less recommended it would be. Or the more careful you have to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to get you, you got to keep the pieces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe one remark regarding the live patchability and non traceability. Uh, the thing is that KLP relies on F trace quite a lot by intention. So if you separated that, I uh, just, that's a whole nother story. A uh, question, um, how big are these uh, modules on average? And do you have stats of, you know, on average, you know, how big they are? Can you, is the mic work? This mic is working, yes. Okay. Sorry, can you speak a little bit? Uh, yeah. How, how big are these modules on average? Do you have stat statistics? of how large these files are. I'm just curious, uh, you know, on average, because you're combining all these fixes into one module. I was just curious how big they are. I think it depends on what you're patching. So if you build a, a module, usually you wouldn't hand write these modules. You'd use a, a system like Hey Patch Build, which Song alluded to. So if you're patching something that's, uh, you know, that's linked against by a lot of people or, or it's like inlined rather in a lot of places, it, it would be bigger or smaller. But I, I haven't looked at the size of the module personally. I don't know if Song has. Yeah, I think it's on the smaller side, like I would say smaller than one megabyte. Oh, I was wondering, like lines of code to, you know, do you know, like on average, like do you guys have stats on that? I'm just curious, you know, not anything. Oh, lines of code, there's like a supporting uh, logic for the module, and there's actually fix of this module. So actual fees will contain every function you want to replace. There's a new copy of the whole function, and the supporting logic will hook the new function to the kernel. So it really depends on the number of fixes. You'll get the size depends. That's dominates the size of the module. Okay, but but no no clear idea on average size or anything like that. It's just hard to say because usually you use tooling to, to build the module. It's not like you, you can write it by hand. And the, the live patch um, self test suite has has modules that they wrote to test, you know, applying different types of modules and shadow variables. They're really small. They're like 50 to 100 lines or something like that, depending on what it's doing. Um, but yeah, I mean, like Song said, if you're 
if you're building a module that's you know inlined in a bunch of places uh, or a function that's inlined in a bunch of places and you're patching several functions it could it could get bigger but you probably wouldn't be writing that yourself there's a question back there that's why i don't do football um do you guys uh, apply uh, apply link time optimizations to the kernel? And if so, do you, or even if not, do you have like an idea of how that would affect live patching? I'm sorry, I didn't get the first part of the question. Um, uh, are you familiar with link time optimizations uh, for the uh, uh, from the uh, compiler? You mean link time optimization? Right, right. Uh, we currently don't do that, and we do have a plan to do that, and we are aware that could be a potential issue with live patch. That's what we probably going to chase later this year or earlier next year. Okay, cool. Great, right, thanks. Oh. Uh, Miroslav, did you want to say something, or did you write in the chat? Uh, yes, I have a question similar to the previous one. So, do you know how many functions do you typically live patch? Uh, usually, that... we'll... like, like how many fixes do we include in a single instance of a live patch? Well, not entirely fixes, but the functions themselves. I mean, because that could have a, some impact on the whole transition and its performance too. You, you can probably you probably have more knowledge about that. Uh, so I, I guess the question is about how many functions we usually patch, and we are in the order of, at the most, in the order of tens of functions, and it's because we just keep building up this accumulative patch, and with the kernel, the first one will probably just have two, three fixes, and let's go along. Right now we have this kernel, we have what we call hot fix 10, that's 10 generations of fixes, so, but we never go beyond 100 functions. And I think this uh, also part of the question is about uh, the, uh, whether that uh, have, uh, in, have an impact on the transition failure rate or I didn't get that part clearly. Well, okay, so theoretically it could happen that if you patch, let's say like ordinary core, core functions quite often, it could have some impact on, on failure rates. While on the other side, if you if you patch only, let's say, functions in kernel modules drivers, then it would not happen much, right? So the question was well, I, mainly uh, by if if you know if there's some distribution regarding this call or driver driver functions. Okay, so. Uh, I got the question now. So yes, I had a similar question before. Is uh, yes, uh, theoretically, with the bigger the the patch is, the higher failure rate gonna go. And but in our case, we never see that being an issue with a bigger patch. The actual issue happens in two cases. Uh, a few cases where there is like we really have a patch uh, a, a thread sleep with a function that we are about to patch. And the other case is like we have a thread, it's not going to sleep. There are actually multiple cases we keep the same. Usually if we get one of these, the failure rate will go 10x or maybe even more, get 100x. But uh, the size of the patch is grow linearly. So usually we don't see a problem with a bigger patch or oh, there's not a huge hit on the failure rate. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So the patches are, because they're binaries, they're specific to a certain version of the kernel, right? So how many versions of the kernel do you support at any given time? Just one, like just the latest kernel, or do you kind of uh, that backport patches to other kernels? I think we have maybe about 10 different uh, kernel release, and each of them may have multiple flavors at, at the time. So we have automation for that supports all of them. And just, yeah, so far it's not a problem. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I was curious if 
uh, there's any services that you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, maybe somebody that hasn't asked if that's okay, Louise. Thanks. So could you, the slide 34, You might have to click the uh, the arrow. So I'm a little cur curious on the PTO optimization you applied uh, with the clown. So did you see, uh, do you know how much the performance benefit from it? Do you have any number for that? Uh, the PTO? Have, yeah, we have some numbers, but let's, I think it's not related to the talk. We can discuss that uh, offline. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody.